Welcome to Speaking of Grace, the weekly message podcast from the Whole Life Church in Orlando, Florida. We're a multi-ethnic, multicultural, and multi-generational congregation committed to our mission of loving people into a lifelong friendship with God. We are committed to our vision of being a church without walls, fully engaged in serving the people of our community. Thank you for joining us as we continue Speaking of Grace. Don't you love Stephanie and Craig? Yeah. Uh, you need to let Steph- Stephanie told me that, it, you know, when I was thanking her earlier for being here, and she said, anytime. So just let her know. Next week we'll see her. The week after that, Craig, you know, just let her know. Um, so so this, uh, this kicks off a series of sermons we're calling The Art of Worship. So... Do you guys have the ability to admit that the Seventh-day Adventist denomination is a little bit cerebral? Can we, can we, can can this group and those of you online kind of come to an agreement that, you know, and I don't, I don't say, I'm not trying to say that in a negative way. Cerebral is important. Logic's important. Uh, Truth is important. So I'm not bashing that. I'm just saying, and. There have been times where those who are artistic have felt a little bit like, where do I belong? Do I have a place? Am I allowed to exercise everything that God has put in me, or do I need to keep a part of that outside of the church because emotion, art, that's, that's not supposed to be, that's not churchy, is it? And what I'm hoping to do over the next several weeks is to show you how art is a important and vital part of our worship experience, individually and collectively. And so that's the purpose of this series. We're we're not going to be talking about how art, these arts are used in, in maybe the secular world. We're really focusing on art in worship. So I just want to set that up for you because I want everybody here, whether you are a cerebral, logical person or whether you are an incredibly artistic person, to know that you have an important and vital role to play here at Whole Life and in the church itself. So that's where this series is coming from. Let's bow our heads as we, as we start off. Lord, we just want to thank you for the opportunity to come together today, and we especially thank you for art. And as we talk about drama today, Lord, I pray that the words that I share would come directly from you. In your name I pray it. Amen. Amen. So John Kyler had a problem. He had a big problem. He didn't like his church. John felt like his church was full of corruption. And John felt like his church wasn't doing a good job of sharing the gospel with the world around it. Now, to add to John's problem, John Kyler was a denominational employee. That can be a problem. So what do you do? Do you get up front and preach a sermon about it? Call out names? Well, John kind of realized that usually that doesn't work out super well. Because, you know, organizations tend to be able to know how to pull the plug really quick. And so John thought probably getting up and preaching, that'll probably get cut off really quick. So John came up with another idea. John said, I'm going to go ahead and do a dramatic presentation. I'm going to do a play. I am going to do a play about Jesus' life. And specifically, I'm going to focus on the Jesus' last supper, his trial, his crucifixion, and his resurrection in this play. That's what I'm going to do. And I'm going to use the play to educate people about the gospel 
and at the same time to point out how maybe there's some similarities to the, from the organized church now and the organized church then. It was daring. But that's the beautiful thing about drama. When you do a dramatic presentation, you're not necessarily saying it. People are inferring it. It means that you can kind of say more while saying less. So John very wisely sets the date for his play on Good Friday. He does the play on Good Friday, and may I say it was very well attended. The king of the country showed up. And that play sparked something. It resonated with the people that watched it. People became inspired to know God better, to try to know who God was and to dig in and try to find scripture so that they could understand who God was too. It sparked something incredible. And John Knox, in the history of the Reformation in Scotland, tells the story of John Kyler. Because it was John Kyler's passion play in 1535 that sparked the beginning of the Reformation that would take place in Scotland. 100 years after that Reformation fanned into full flame, people gathered to sign a covenant, and they did it on purpose in 1638. They did it in 1638 to commemorate John Kyler being burnt at the stake in 1538 for putting on that play. Drama changes the world. And John Kyler was willing to give his life to change the world. There's a really amazing quote when I was reading about John Kyler's story that comes from Paul James Griffiths, um, historian. He wrote this on the website ChristianHeritageEdinburgh.org. He said, ultimately what began with a Christian play led to our democracy and the human rights movement. And in Scotland, it started with a play. Drama has power. It has power for good. Now, if you ask historians, historians are going to tell you that theater as we know it today, the movies, the plays that we experience, it really began back in Greece, that the Greeks kind of invented theater. And they did it actually as a part of worship of pagan gods. And probably for that reason, those same historians will tell you that Christian plays and drama and theater didn't really take off in the Christian church until late in the 10th century. And when it did take off, it was, again, stories of biblical story depictions, passion plays like the one that John Kyler did. However, is that really true that drama was not a part of worship until the Greeks came up with it? That's not the way I read my Bible. That's not the way I read my Bible. Let's go ahead and, and just together think of a few examples in the Bible. If you go back to the book of Exodus and Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy, you're going to see that God sets up a sanctuary in the wilderness. There is some very vivid acts that happen inside this sanctuary, because when the lamb is brought to the priest to be slaughtered, it wasn't that lamb that was taking away the person's sins. It was a symbol of what Christ would do. 
a dramatic act to make a point. What about the, the big laver of water that the priests would cleanse themselves with? Symbolism. An act to make a point. Some of you might say, I don't know, Ken. I mean, stretching it a little bit on me? Bear with me. Let's, let's use another example then. What about, uh, what about Ezekiel's brick? You guys are all familiar with that story, right? You know the one, Ezekiel's brick? Okay, some of you are looking a little lost. Do I, can I get a volunteer to help me out? Yes, you guys are getting wise to me, aren't you? <laughs> no, thank you. All right, I, I do. Uh, let's go ahead and uh, let's see. Can I pick on somebody? Yeah. I'm going to, you know, Albert, I'll pick on you today. I want to pick on you today, Albert. I, I need to pick on you. You're staff, so, you know. <laughs> Nobody else volunteered. Sorry, buddy. I need you to pick the brick up for me. Come on up on the stage. Yep, bring the Sharpie with you. It's important. So God uh, had a prophet named Ezekiel. And uh, you're going to be Ezekiel today. Okay, you ready for this? So God said to Ezekiel, I want you to take a brick. You already got your brick. He said, I don't think he said a Sharpie, but he said, I want you to write, I want you to draw the city of Jerusalem on the brick. So just go ahead and put the brick on the ground. And I want you to go ahead and draw the city of Jerusalem on it. Just start. You'll, you know, we'll wait. The whole city? Yeah, the whole city. It's actually very important, and it needs to be accurate. Um, I don't have a gold marker, though. Uh, just, just draw. Okay, so he's doing pretty good. Okay, so you pretty much got it there. Um, so now what you're going to do, no, just stay there, Ezekiel. Just stay there. God tells Ezekiel, stay there. And now what I want you to do is I need you to build siege works around the city. Just pretend. Build siege works around the city. Okay. All right. That's pretty good. Well, okay, you're doing all right. And then God says, and I'm condensing a little here. You can go read the story for yourself in Ezekiel chapter four this afternoon because I don't have time to do the whole thing. But then God says, and this is my favorite part. God says to Ezekiel, here's what I want you to do. I need you to go ahead and make probably about a year and a half's worth of food. But you're going to go ahead and cook that food over human waste. <laughs> we won't ask you to do that um, right now. But I think it's important to note that God did ask Ezekiel to do that. And Ezekiel had the same reaction, by the way. Ezekiel was like, please, no. Please, <laughs> please, no. And God says, all right, you can cook it over animal waste instead. And Ezekiel was like, oh, thank I, I don't know. I mean, he must have been like, well, I, I guess that's better than the other option. So he cooks the food. No, 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 no. We're not done. We're not done. It's a long squat. It, oh, well, <laughs> he says it's a long squat. Listen to what's coming up now. So God says, okay, you've got your food ready. Now I want you to go ahead and lay down on your left side. Lay down on your left side. That, yep, you got it. Your left side. All right. I want you to stay there for 390 days. For, uh, to represent the sins of it. You stay there for 309 days. But don't worry, you get to eat the food that you already cooked, okay? Um, that's okay. So you're going to, that's going to, okay, so 309 days. And then God says, okay, and then after that, go ahead and turn over on your right side. Yep, there you go. You're getting the hang of this. And I want you to stay there for only another 40 days. Man, if I'm Ezekiel, I'm like, God, people already think pastors are lazy. Uh, laying on my side is not going to help anything for, you know, a year and a half. But can you imagine 390 days? 300, that's, that's more than a year. And then another 40 days after that, all 
making a representation. I'm not going to get into what all it symbolized. Go read it for yourself, Ezekiel chapter 4. You're just going to stay there for the, I mean, if Ezekiel could do it for 300 or 430 days, you can stay there for the rest of the sermon, right? No, you're going to be distracting. Get up. You, you get out of here. Get out of here. Thank you, Albert. Thank you. Yeah. Oh, hang on a second, Albert. Uh, now we're going to do the story of Jeremiah's underwear. So, um, no, you can sit down. Um, no, but seriously, this is a nut, like, seriously, this is Jeremiah chapter 13. God tells Jeremiah, I want you to go buy a linen loincloth. The equivalent today would be saying, go buy yourself a nice pair of boxers. And he says to Jeremiah, wear those boxers. And the Bible doesn't really get into how long. He just says, don't take them off for a while. Now, I want to ask you, <laughs> Jeremiah was kind of somewhat, he was a prophet, but he was kind of a pastor in a sense to, to the people there. Now, how weird would it be for you if I got up front next week <laughs> and said, God told me, I'm just going to stop right there, but maybe it would be better than, than Hosea who is told to, well, that's, go read that story for yourself. Do you see what I'm saying? God used drama. God used acts to make points to his people. It's all throughout the Old Testament. And then we jump into the New Testament. He said, I don't believe I remember Jesus putting on a passion play. I don't believe I remember Jesus doing theater. You're right, he didn't. That we're aware of but he did tell parables. And might I take a moment to say they weren't all true? Oh, well, a few of you are like, oh, is that true? Well, if you're Seventh-day Adventist, you better believe it's true. Because our theology says that we believe that when you die, you sleep. And Jesus told a story about the rich man and Lazarus. One of them goes to hell. The other one goes to the bosom of Abraham. And they talk to each other after they're dead. <laughs> and some theologians believe that Jesus actually borrowed that story from some Egyptian parables. And then he repurposed it for what he was needing his audience to hear. And in fact, many of the parables that Jesus tell appear to have come from different sources. And Jesus takes these stories that people are familiar with and then he turns them upside down. Because there's nothing that catches your attention like thinking you know the story and then, woof, it's changed. And Jesus was the master of doing this. In fact, the story of the son that runs away from his father, takes the wealth, we sometimes call it the prodigal son, although I agree with Tim Keller, I think it's the prodigal God. I love that better. He makes the point that, uh, Tim makes the point in his book, that that story was one that was told by the religious leaders in Jesus' time, except the father doesn't accept the son back at the end, and Jesus turns it upside down and and has the father accept the son back. Now think about the early part of Jesus' ministry. Matthew 5, Sermon on the Mount. Good expository preaching. But then if you notice something in the Gospels, Jesus seems to do this U-turn. He goes away from this expository type of preaching, this deep intellectual stuff, and he moves into storytelling. Parables. And I really love what one of the founders of the Seventh-day Adventist Church, Ellen White, has to say about this shift that happened. In her book, Christ's Object Lessons, Ellen White writes this. She says, in the earlier part of his ministry, Christ had spoken to the people in words so plain that all his hearers might have grasped truths which would make them wise into salvation. But in many hearts, the truth had taken no root and had been quickly caught away. Jesus desired to awaken inquiry. He sought to arouse the careless and impress truth upon the heart. 
parable teaching was popular and commanded the respect and attention, not only of the Jews, but of the people of other nations, no more effective method of instruction could he have employed. Isn't it interesting that God incarnate changes up his methods to be effective? I'll let that sit for a second. What does it mean to worship? It means to honor or show reverence for, as a divine being or supernatural power, to honor or show reverence for a divine being or supernatural power. So when we talk about worshiping God, we're talking about honoring or showing reverence What does that look like? Well, to me, it looks like, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And that includes drama. When you do drama, do it for the glory of God. That is an act of worship, bringing honor and respect to God. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable, and right, and pure, and lovely, and admirable. Think about the things that are excellent and worthy of praise. For me, this is where good drama comes in. It's where worshipful drama glorifies God. It points us to that which we should be thinking about, that which can change our hearts and make a difference. And some of you are thinking, I don't know, Ken, I feel like you may be overstating things. Thanks for that story about John Kyler, because if any of you have heard it, I'm shocked. But I want you to stop and think in your life about drama that has changed. I'm not talking about the, you know, office drama or, you know, I'm not talking, you know, relational drama. I'm talking about, I want to talk about drama you may have seen in a worship setting or on a TV or in a theater? How has it influenced the way that you view the world, the lens that you see it through? Because that's the beauty of drama. It, in a, When I get up front, if I preach a fire and brimstone sermon, half of you will walk out, and as soon as you hear me going somewhere that, that turns you off or that you don't agree with, you turn me off, and you don't really listen anymore. You're like, I just don't agree with that. But the thing about drama is that when you watch drama, You start pondering it. You don't turn it off the same way that you turn me off when I'm talking. Let me give you an example of that. Uh, For many years, we would do, uh, at at some of the churches I pastored, we would do an Easter, a huge Easter production. And during this Easter production, we would use Christian contemporary music and act out um, the life of Jesus. We'd start actually with the war in heaven. We'd talk about creation, the fall of humanity. Then we'd move to Jesus' life his teachings, his, his, resurrection, or his death, resurrection. And it was really fun. This is one of the groups that I did it with at Upper Columbia Academy and Cheney Churches out in Spokane, Washington. And this particular play really hit me in, in a meaningful place because um, the stage director had children in, this, in the play. And one of the things I did with the stage directors is I always asked them to dress in costumes so they could walk out on stage if they needed to move somebody around or something and not, not be obvious. And so at the end of this play, the last scene is Jesus' second coming and people are being raised back to life. And one of the things that we told all the people being raised back to life is don't just stand there like this. Walk around and act like you would when you're seeing somebody that, that you love that's passed away that you finally get to see again. And so the the whole stage just breaks out on this big, everybody hugging each other. And so this mother would always come out on the stage and find her, you know, seven or eight year old son and they would hug, you know, on the stage. And it was this, it was kind of touching. Well, she invited her parents who were, who were not believers to come to this play. And they came to the play to support what was happening. Not because they were interested in having her religious experience, but to support these two people. And I know God orchestrated it this way, but on, this play, on the night that they came and attended, the mother who was doing the stage direction did not have time to come out for the final scene. She was busy redirecting something that happened backstage. And her little boy wandered around the stage looking for his mom.
And after it was over, our stage director's parents came up to her and say, said, we watched our grandson wander around looking for you. And it hit us that maybe that's what, he, maybe we need to rethink our position on God because that's the power of trauma. It's the power of drama. I just have one ask for you. <laughs> you didn't know we have a drama team. It's because COVID did to drama teams what COVID did to everything else. And so we're trying to get it restarted. If you have a passion for it, you'd like to be a part of it, you'd like to maybe lead it, we'd love to hear from you. You just go to wholelife.church slash drama and let us know if you'd like to be a part of that. Now I will say right now, our drama team is high school and up, but maybe you have a passion for doing things with children and you'd like to tell us how we could, that you'd be happy to help us start something for our kids that they could do. I just wanna encourage you that drama is a part of the art of worship. It changes lives and at least in Scotland's, in the history of Scotland, it led a reformation that changed the face of a country, and I believe it can do the same here in Orlando. Hi. Hey, Gabby. Hi, Pastor Ken. How are you? I'm great. Good. So I have time for maybe like one question. Okay. Um, it comes from Matthew, and he asks, so God changes things to be effective. The one thing I'm a bit confused about this, and maybe this is in the wrong context, but help me understand what about the scripture that says that God is the same today, yesterday, in the future, etc.? How does this fit into the context of drama? I believe that God's principles are the same yesterday, tomorrow, and forever. But I believe the way that those principles are applied changes. And we can use drama to do so. Exactly. I love and it. And so, um, you know, the principle of love, that doesn't change. Uh, the principle of God is truth that doesn't change. But the way that if you look at, at the Christian church throughout history, if you look at, at how God has revealed himself through the Bible, and then in the Old Testament, New Testament, it's clear that God modifies things to fit the time, the culture, and the place. That doesn't mean that truth changes. It just means that God adapts to us as imperfect individuals. And, uh, and so I think that we see that as a, as a part of drama. And uh, the question is, what can God not redeem? Lynn also asks, does that mean that we'll reinstate drama, special music, and reading theaters into every worship now? Well, I guess that depends on how many of you go to wholelife.church slash drama. <laughs> We would really love, and, and we do, we need, one of the things that we're going to, we're really trying to put together is some workshops, like writing uh, for that, um, acting workshops, um, direction. Um, and so we, we need, for those of you who, this is your thing, we need you. Um, this is your chance. Let us know. Wholelife.church slash drama. Perfect. If your question went unanswered, don't fret. It will be covered in the podcast as well. Or we might cover it during second service. So maybe you just have to join us again. I just again. love the fact that you use the word fret. Is that the wrong I, word? No, it's, oh. the, it's perfect. It's just, oh, I would expect that out of, you know, somebody older than you, maybe. <laughs> I'm being dramatic. Okay. Yeah, excellent. Well done. <laughs> Tune into that podcast. I have a feeling we're going to have a fun conversation. Hi, this is Randy McGray, podcast producer and host here at Whole Life Church. Loving people into a lifelong friendship with God is our mission at the Whole Life Church, and our podcasts are designed to help facilitate conversations that help us grow together in that pursuit. Now that you've heard the message for this week, don't forget to check out the Whole Life Takeaways for this message. Swipe up in today's show notes and join the conversation. Speaking of conversations, each Wednesday morning we take a closer look at the week's message. That's right, the one you just listened to. We discuss practical ways to apply spiritual lessons and ask honest questions about the issues we face as Christians, all focused through the lens of grace. 
Your voice is a welcomed addition to that conversation. We encourage your thoughts and your questions by sending a voicemail or text to 407-965-1607 or send an email to podcast at wholelife.church. You can find everything podcast related on our website, wholelife.church slash podcast. And plan on spending every Tuesday evening and Wednesday morning with us as we bring you the Whole Life Church inspiration you love straight into your headphones. Thanks for listening and have a great week.